house of God. Our God is victorious. Oh, He is glorious as well. So rise and give you praise today because we have a victorious God. Amen. And the battle belongs to Him. Come on, join me and let's praise Him.
powerful to experience his power. Amen. As we dive in into his presence, Gateway, we know that in our hearts, God should be seated in the throne of our hearts. Amen. That's so why we can worship him in spirit and in truth. Oh, without holding back, Gateway, let our words be a blessing to God, and we will reap the benefits of worshiping. we 
Coming to the presence of God, gateway. There shouldn't be any struggle in worshiping God, amen? Because as we look down in ourselves, in our heart, the throne of our heart is where God sits, amen? That's why we worship Him in spirit and in truth. We were created to last forever, and we worship Him today with a grateful heart.
we sing that one more time, Gateway? So I'll stand. Just the voices. With arms high and high. Come on. Yes. Hero of the one who gave it all. I'll stand my soul. such a blessing to be in the house of God together gateway we feel empowered we feel that the purpose is being fulfilled because we were created to last forever amen hallelujah amen so before you take your seats please move around greet your neighbors bless them with, the, with your beautiful smiles come on gateway and then turn your eyes on the screen you got to see this it's a recap of what happened last Friday thank you gateway Amen. Welcome to church. It's another great Sunday to be here in God's house, and we are so glad that you made the decision to get up and come to church today. Hey, if you're a guest with us, we want to say an extra special welcome to you. This is truly a place where you can feel that you belong and at home, so a big gateway welcome to you. If you are that guest, we'd love if you do us a favor and fill out what we call a Connect card. You'll find one of those Connect cards under the seat in front of you or on the table at the back of the auditorium. Simply fill it out and drop it in one of the giving boxes at the end of today's service. Bibles are so important, and if you don't have your very own copy of God's Word, we want to make sure that you have one today before you leave church. 
At the end of the service, you will find a smiling face ready to give you your very own Bible at a table at the back of the auditorium. So at the end of the service, make sure you head to the back and seek out that smiling face to get your very own Bible. As usual, make sure you're staying tuned to our online church calendar at gatewayonline.ca slash what's happening for everything you need to know that's going on here throughout the week. Sharing is caring, and we want to encourage you to share our social media posts and invite people to church. We've been talking about this the last few weeks, and Pastor Brian has been encouraging us in his sermon series of Leave No Lamb Behind, that it is our duty and our job and our honor to be inviting people to church. We don't want to leave anyone behind. We don't want anyone to miss out on the good news of Jesus and being part of a church community and local church. So make sure you're inviting people and sharing our posts on social media is a great way to spread the word about what God is doing right here at Gateway. Hey, if you took one of the membership packages a few weeks ago, this is your reminder that we need to have that membership package back. So if you are still planning to pursue membership here at Gateway, please make sure you bring in your filled out membership form next Sunday. Tomorrow's the day Pastor Brian and I are heading off to Vietnam and Cambodia. So we want to remind you, please be keeping us in your prayers as we make this trip. We know that God's blessing is all over this trip and we are going to be used to bring encouragement to our missions partners in Vietnam and Cambodia. So thank you so much for keeping us in your prayers over the next two weeks. Thank you, Gateway, for your obedience to God's word and bringing your tithe into the local church. We know that you are blessed for it. Here's three ways that you can continue to give today. The first is by giving in person and dropping your giving in one of the giving boxes. The second is by giving online. You can head to gatewayonline.ca slash give and follow the prompts. And the third way is by text to give. Simply text the word give to the number that's on the screen right now and follow the prompts. That's all I got for you. So have a super week. We'll see you right back here next Sunday. And Pastor Brian, over to you for the last session in our series, Leave No Lamb Behind. All right, good afternoon, Gateway. The blessing of the Lord be upon you. Hey, just turn to your neighbor right now and say, spring is coming. You know, church, I promise you next Sunday it is going to be plus 25 degrees Celsius in Vietnam. Yes. And we're going to be thinking about you guys back here. <laughs> You know, it's amazing living in the jet age. As somebody said, breakfast in New York, lunch in Chicago, supper in Seattle, and baggage in Denver. I want you to know that's not going to happen to us. Our suitcases are going to be with us every leg of the journey. Amen. Keep us in prayer, would you? I said, keep us in prayer, would you? Amen. Of course. Let's do this together. Just because you're not going with us on the trip doesn't mean you're not a part of this venture. Definitely be praying. This coming week we'll be in Vietnam, the following week in Cambodia, and we just know the Lord is with us every step of the way. As Rebecca said, it's an opportunity for us to bring much encouragement to speak the word to our, our co-workers over in the beautiful land of Vietnam and Cambodia. What a what a richness of, of culture we've experienced any time that we've been there. And we haven't been there for four years now. And, and so we are anticipating that the, the kids at the children's home in Phnom Penh are so much older and have such a, a good command of the English language now. It's going to be so much easier to visit with them. And we just believe that in a number of different ways, we're just going to see the favor and the goodness of God stamped upon this trip. So for sure, be praying with us. And, uh, and hey, I just want to say that, that the expenses of this mission trip are already covered. But if you, if you do feel in your heart that you want to get into the act and make a contribution to the cause, you certainly are welcome to do that. Because I tell you, anytime we've made these mission trips, it is an absolute joy to be able to put an envelope in their hands and say, here's an additional blessing from Gateway back home. And of course, our money in Canadian funds goes so much further over in those nations. And you would be blessed 
blessed for it. If you, out of a spirit-touched heart, want to make a contribution, you certainly can do that in all of the regular ways of, of giving. Simply mark it for the mission trip and We'll make sure it gets to the right place. Hey, next Sunday, you definitely want to be here. Wally Adabogan is going to be preaching the word next Sunday. And then the following Sunday, Pastor Barb is going to be preaching the word right here at Gateway. You want to know what she's going to be preaching about? I'm not telling. You got to come and find out for yourself. Come on. Rule number 27 of, of a happily married life is that husbands do not tell other people your wife's secrets. And so for my own preservation, uh, I'm not telling. You come and find out. She'll definitely deliver the word to you. All right, before we get into the message today, would you stand to your feet and boldly repeat after me, I love God. Therefore, I love the word of God. The teachings of Jesus are my greatest counsel. My pride and passion is to follow his example. See, the Bible is truth to my spirit, joy to my soul, and health to my body. Help me, Lord, to know the book and walk the walk. Amen. Come on, somebody give the Lord some praise. Yeah, praise him for the privilege of having the word of God in our possession. Isn't that good? All right. You may be seated. And just a quick word to those who are joining us online. Special welcome. Really good to have you with us. You know, again, technology is, is just terrific, isn't it? You know, when I was a kid, that term online had something to do with laundry. But now we've got a whole new light on the subject, and, and now we can watch our favorite church service from anywhere in the world. How cool is that, right? Okay, today, as Rebecca said, we're going to conclude this series of messages that we've been calling Leave No Lamb Behind, based, of course, on Jesus' parable of the lost sheep. But today, I want to switch gears, okay? For the past month, we've been looking at the Gospel of Luke chapter 15, but today, I want to read this parable from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 18, where Jesus tells the very same story. You know, the shepherd has a hundred sheep, but then one of them wanders off and gets lost, and the shepherd goes looking for the sheep and finds it and brings it back home, and so the lost is found, and it's all good, right? But please note, the context in which this story is given here in Matthew 18 is totally different than the context that this story is given in Luke 15. And so Luke 15, right? The last few weeks we've, we've been talking about how Jesus tells this story of the lost sheep. And, and he gives this parable in response to the religious officials who were complaining about Jesus fraternizing with, with sinners, right? And the point that Jesus was making with that parable there in Luke 15 was, was that there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than there is over 99 people who did not need to repent. But here in Matthew 18, Jesus uses the very same story, but for a different purpose. He uses the story here in Matthew's gospel to illustrate the high value that God places upon children. So it's the same parable, but two very different scenarios in which Jesus told this story. You understand, Jesus is a master storyteller, right? I mean, he had a whole collection of stories that he used to illustrate how the kingdom of God, God works. And obviously, Jesus repeated some of these stories to different crowds in different places to serve different purposes. And, and of course, why wouldn't he, right? A good story is worth repeating. And I mean, he's, he's an itinerant preacher. So, of course, he's going to repeat some of the same sermons with the same sermon illustrations in various places across the map. So, if you read this parable from the Gospel of Luke, and then you read it again from the Gospel of Matthew, please do not say, what's going on here? Wait just a minute. These two Gospel authors, one of them's got their story mixed up. One of them wasn't remembering correctly when and where it was that Jesus told this story. They need to get their facts straight. No, don't say that. 
You don't want to come away from, from these Gospels with that impression because here's, here's what's going on. It's the same story, but it's given on two separate occasions to serve two different purposes. So today, let's read again the parable of the lost sheep. But this time, we're reading it as it pertains to children and youth. So I want to call this message this afternoon, The Next Generation of Sheep. Are you with me? Let's go. Matthew 18, beginning in verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him. Obviously, there were some children in the company of people that were listening to Jesus' teaching session that day. And so he calls one of the children to come to him. And he placed the child among them. And Jesus said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever assumes the humble heart of a child, that's the one that readily enters the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, Jesus said. Now, before we read on, may I just point out that in this passage of Scripture, so verse 1 through 14 of of Matthew 18. Several times in those verses, Jesus references children or little ones. And so does he mean boys and girls? Or is he talking about, you know, somebody who's a child of God, even even adults who have childlike faith? Is that is that what he means? Well, the consensus among Bible scholars is that the answer is both. So in verse six, Jesus defines little ones by saying it's it's those who believe in Jesus. But clearly, as you read the entire passage, he's also referring to the heavenly Father's heart for the members of the young generation. How many of you know that our heavenly Father has a special place in his heart for those who are young, spiritually young, or even physically young? The Father loves people. He certainly loves Little children. And, and, and so here's, here's what we see in verse 6. Jesus says, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, if he causes them to stumble, it would be better for that person to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Whoa. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble or that cause people to to, to, to stray away from the good shepherd, whether they're young or old. Woe be to those who cause people to stumble to lose their way, to wander away. Imagine drifting away from the God who created us in the first place, the God who loves us so deeply, so dearly. Woe be to the person who influences another person to wander in the wrong direction as opposed to drawing near to the Lord. Jesus' words couldn't be any clearer here. He he says, listen, woe to the world uh, because uh, of, of the the things that cause people to stumble, such things must come. He said, this is, this is going to happen. There are going to be people who are influenced by other people to, to not serve God. There's going to be people who are dissuaded spiritually by other people. Watch out for those people. And so Jesus said, such things must come, but woe to the person through whom They come, woe to the person who causes others to stumble spiritually. Oh my goodness. That's the strong language of the Bible right there if we ever saw it. Come on, how many of you would admit that the first time you ever read this passage of Scripture that you thought to yourself, I can't believe believe that Jesus said that. He's talking about being thrown into the lake wearing a millstone necklace. Just turn to your neighbor and say, that's pretty heavy. Yeah, and if we were to read on 
It gets even more graphic, but we're going to skip over those verses because this is a family church service, right? You know, it sounds like gangster terminology, but in reality, it's just Jesus expressing in no uncertain terms the the protective uh, uh, sentiment of, of our heavenly father toward his lambs, especially the tender young one. That's what Jesus is talking about here. We read on down in verse 10. He, he says, see that, that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the Father in heaven. One translation puts it this way. These angelic guardians have direct access to the Father. The inference is that, that, that if you mislead or mistreat one of these little ones, The angels will rat you out to the Father. That's what it sounds like. It's an interesting verse, that 11th verse. Verse 12, Jesus said, what do you think? Here comes our parable. If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go out looking for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly, I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. Folks, how many of you know that in this 21st century, the ratio between those who stayed and those who strayed is not 99 to 1, not even close. Like the ratio between those who stayed in church And those who strayed away from church, it's not 99 to 1. Boy, the people who conduct surveys and track statistics about these things, they tell us that somewhere between 70 and 80% of those who were raised in a Christian church somehow found the exit during their teenage years. How sad is that statistic? I said, let it not be so in this church. I said, let it not be so in this church. Come on, the good news is that that over the course of time, in many cases, people who did drift away from the Lord and away from the faith of their childhood, many times they come to their senses and they find their way back into the house of God. And so we catch them on the rebound. That is a very good thing. But still, we're talking about a shepherd. He's not out there just looking for one. It's not like 99 were faithful to the Lord, but there was one that got away. No, no, no. He's out there looking for the 50%, the 60%, the 70%. He's searching for those who have somehow wandered away from their faith. And he hasn't given up on them. He hasn't written off, written them off. He still loves them. He's still seeking them out. Somebody say, Amen. Listen very carefully. The numbers in this parable, 99 and 1, they are very significant numbers, especially that number 1, because at the heart of this parable is a wonderful biblical truth, and it's this. Listen very carefully. Every life matters. Yeah, every person is valuable. Every person is special. Every person is loved by the good shepherd. Every lamb is precious. Just turn to your neighbor right now and say, and that includes you. Do you see that in this parable? He leaves the 99 and he goes searching for the one. Clearly that tells us the heart of the Lord, how he personally is invested in every individual. You are special, my friend. You see, the shepherd doesn't say, oh, well, I still have 99. Who cares about that one? He just keeps wandering off anyway. No, that is not the heart of God. He's looking for the one. It kind of reminds us of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 29. He said, when one little sparrow falls to the ground, my father notices that, and he cares about that shepherd. And then Jesus said this. He said, and you people are worth more than many sparrows. Listen, the Lord cares deeply about every person, and he's trying to teach you and I to have his 
his same heart for people. He wants us to care about every person that crosses our path. Now listen, you can't reach out and save everyone, but you can help some. I said you can help some. Do you remember the story about the kid who was on the beach one day? It was the day after there had been a really powerful storm with huge waves. And during the storm, there were hundreds, if not thousands, of starfish that were washed up on the beach. And now the, the waves had gone back down again. And here's all oh, the, the beach was just scattered with these starfish. And of course, when the sun comes up and begins to bake the beach... Those starfish are stranded, and they cannot survive when, when they become dried out. And here's this boy. He's on the beach, and he picks up a starfish, and he tosses it back into the water. And then he picks up another starfish and tosses it into the water. Along comes a gentleman, and he surveys the situation, and he engages this kid. He says, hey, I see what you're trying to do. He, he says, you're trying to rescue these starfish, aren't you? And the boy says, yes, sir. And the man said, well, listen, there are so many starfish. I mean, I appreciate what you're trying to do, but what difference will it make? The boy picked up another starfish, and he said, it makes a difference to this one, sir. And he tossed it back out into the water. Yeah, go ahead and give, give a hand clap because that's the heart of the Lord. He cares about starfish and he cares even more about the souls of, of people like you and I and people that you and I will meet along the way who need the Lord or they need to come back to the Lord. Listen, when, when, you, when you encounter an individual who obviously needs Jesus, when you have the opportunity to reach out and and share the good news of the saving grace of Jesus with someone. I mean, it's in your family circle, or it's somebody that you work alongside of in the workplace, or whoever it might be. When you have occasion to touch somebody with the terms of the gospel, when you give some simple explanation about why Jesus died on the cross, because he was taking the blame for all of us. He was a sacrificial lamb, and his, his uh, offering himself up to God was totally satisfactory to the Father, and therefore the father says i'm willing to forgive anyone who will put their faith in the saviorship of my son and so when we come to our senses and realize yes i need this good news of the gospel i need to be spiritually reborn my friend if you are instrumental in helping somebody else to find their way into the family of god oh my goodness what what, what a gratifying experience that is you can make the difference not just in the life of a starfish you can make the eternal difference in the life of a person that Jesus died for. We have our work cut out for us, don't we? We need to be about the Father's business, but I'm telling you what a difference it can make. All right, in the next 19 minutes, I want to put on the table four soul-searching questions that beg for our attention. Are you ready? Here we go. Number one, this is actually a two-part question. Do you have any members of the next generation within your sphere of influence? And if so, are you prepared to do whatever you can to see to it that they do not wander away from the good shepherd? I mean, it might be your own children or grandchildren, or it might be children who, who belong to, you know, some a family that is friends of your family, or you might be an uncle or an auntie or a school teacher or a Sunday school teacher or a youth leader or just a Christian that some kids look up to. And, and so they probably have some certain expectations of, of how you do your, your Christian life. Who are the young sheep that know your name and you know their name? And they know that you call yourself a Christian. You are an example. We, we have a call of God upon our lives to model this Christian life. You are influential. Come on, everybody say, I am a good influence. Let's look again at verse 6 of Matthew 18. Jesus said, if anyone causes one of these little ones to stumble... Some translation says, if anyone causes one of these little ones to sin, 
The New Living tra Translation puts it this way. If anyone causes one of these that trusts in me to lose faith. And Jesus said, they, 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 they'd be better off wearing that jewelry. You know, that millstone necklace. Just think about the countless situation where kids have been turned off from Christianity due to the bad influence of adults in their life. I mean, all of us in this room, we could tell stories. Lord, help us that we're not the bad guy in the story, right? And Jesus went on record here as saying, if you teach the little ones to sin, you are better off to be drowned yourself. Oh my goodness, Jesus said that? Yes, it's recorded in the Word of God. It's intended to, 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 to get our attention. In the following chapter, Matthew 19, do you remember the account of some of the parents who were trying to bring their children to Jesus? Wow, sounds reasonable to me. But in verse 13, it says, Then people brought little children to Jesus for Him to place His hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Not, not the Pharisees. The disciples who should know better. They rebuked these parents and they said, what do you think this is, a playground? Take those kids away from... When Jesus heard what was going on, he said, wait just a minute. Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. This is the word of God to us. Do not hinder the children, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And then he placed his hands on them and blessed them. And, and then he went on from there. Wow, you catch a hold of the heart. Jesus has a special place in his heart for, for children and youth. Somebody say amen. Hopefully this was a lesson learned by the disciples. Do not hinder children. The Lord puts a very high premium on the young generation. And so must we. Oh, I hope that Peter, James, and John learned from this experience. I hope that you and I can learn from that word of God, dear. Jesus, come, Holy Spirit, instill in every one of us such a passion to see the young generation of sheep rise up and serve God in their generation. You ought to be saying amen to that. Folks, Jesus clearly understood that children and youth are very influenceable. Adults have a huge role in helping to shape kids' character, shaping their future, both their earthly future and their, their eternal future. Jesus knew. And oh, Holy Spirit, cause it to be revelation to us as well. Jesus knew very well that every young child is a seed Every kid is a seed, and if nurtured properly, that kid has phenomenal potential, potential to rise up and be a worshiper of the living God. They have potential to be successful in business in Jesus' name. They have potential to lead a life that is very happy and healthy in every sense of the meaning of the word. They have the potential to live in the realm of divine favor. Imagine that God on their side every day of their life. These kids are a seed. They have the potential to have a positive impact on many other people with whom they have to do. These kids have the potential to live forever in the kingdom of heaven. How about that? Or, everybody say or. Or that kid that is a seed has the potential to mess up their lives. They have the potential to be deceived by that big bad wolf in sheep's clothing. They have the potential to become a runaway lamb. They have the potential to lead a life that is downright miserable. But if you and I have anything to say about it, and we do, that's not going to happen, right? I mean, you could say that every kid is a seed of potential that can go one way or the other. Their potential could be expressed in terms of P-R-A-Y. Or P-R-E-Y. No wonder Jesus felt so strongly about not hurting the chances of children. 
folks, if I'm hearing Jesus correctly here in Matthew chapter 18, he is saying, don't anybody dare to hinder these young sheep. On the contrary, do everything you can to encourage these young ones. Listen, in your travels through the Word of God, you ever come across this, this issue that I'm about to s- describe? I see it in several different places in, in the Bible. I want to give you a couple of examples of it, but, uh, but, but here's, here's the issue. I, I think we detect it here in Matthew 18. Listen very carefully. It's one thing for a person to reject the claims of Christ. Basically to say, thanks, but no thank you to the gospel. You know, for a person to poo-poo the Bible or to flatly refuse to worship God or even to believe that there is a God. You see, it's one thing for a person to take a position of being contrary to the Lord. But it's another thing altogether to discourage someone else from serving God. You know, to drag somebody else down with you. That's a serious indictment in Scripture. It really is. Let me give you an example. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 13, this is where Jesus said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you shut the door. You slam the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those who are wanting to enter, you you, you don't let them get in. You prevent others from entering the kingdom. You try to stop people. How wrong is that? A couple of weeks ago, Gavin Wagner and I were were reading. We've been working our way through the book of of Deuteronomy. We came to chapter 13. What interesting reading that is. I'm not going to read that entire chapter, but but the Lord goes to great lengths in Deuteronomy 13 to to, to give a warning to Israel. In verse 6, he says, it might be your, your own brother or your son or your daughter, your spouse. It might be your best friend that tempts you to do something wrong. He goes on. It could even be your your own parents that influence you to turn away from the Lord. And further on down in the chapter, he says, this sort of thing is what God hates. You know, there's a number of places in the Bible where it describes something that God finds detestable, something that God hates. The Bible uses that language. And whenever you read something that the Bible says God hates, wow, he should have your attention. God hates it when one person actually dissuades another person from following the Lord and walking in the light. Listen, if you want to go golfing on Sunday morning, good for you, but don't invite me to come with you. Come on, if you know very well that I normally would be with my family in church on a Sunday morning, don't be inviting me to go somewhere else to do something else because in a weak moment I might even say, okay. And then you just got me in the doghouse with my wife. To all of you moms and dads here this afternoon, I tell you, I applaud you for getting your little flock of kids into church on Sunday. My goodness, when your sons and daughters see you worshiping, when they see you tithing, when they see you reaching out and sharing your faith and inviting other people to come to church, when they see you praying, when they see you in the Word of God, when they see you setting an example of of what a Christian is good for you you. You're pointing your kids to Jesus. You're pointing them to the truth. You're pointing them toward their ultimate destination, which is heaven. Way to go, mom and dad. Look, I get it. There are some extenuating circumstances. There's some legitimate reasons why sometimes we're not able to be in church on Sunday. There's illness in the household, or we have some work commitments to attend to that don't allow us to, to be in church that, that weekend, or, or, you know, we got raptured on Thursday, so we're not able to make it to church on Sunday, or, you know, you're out of town traveling, you're on vacation, so, Pastor, we're not going to be there on Sunday. I get it. There are some of those kind of situations. But listen, if you want to set your kids up for success, get them in that groove. Hey, as a family, we're doing church on any given Sunday. You know, Mary and Joseph did a fantastic job with Jesus during his entire 33 and a half year year visit to planet Earth. There was only one weekend, one weekend when Jesus did not make it to church. 
Yeah, the only time he missed synagogue on the Sabbath was that one weekend when the Sabbath was sandwiched in between Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. I would say he had a legitimate excuse for not being in church that weekend. How about you? You can't use that excuse, though. Proverbs 22, verse 6, train up a child in the way he or she should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. I'm telling you, train up a kid to walk in the ways of the Lord, and when they are old, they will thank you for it. Yes, they will. I am so eternally grateful to my mom and dad because, because uh, you know, church was just non-negotiable. I mean, I mean, their position was, hey, we're Christians. It's Sunday. We're going to church. We're Christians. It's Sunday. We're going to church. It's not optional. It's not debatable. You know, my mother, bless her heart. It didn't matter how cold it was on those Sunday mornings in Edmonton. When, when it was a weekend when dad was at work on the railway using the family vehicle to, to get to and from work, my mom got the four of us kids ready and off we went marching over to the, the bus stop and waiting for the city transit bus and, and we went to church and then back home again the same way. Didn't matter how cold it was my mom said no we're, we're that's that's church we're we're Christians it's Sunday we're going to church there was no online church just online laundry if you know what I'm saying so question number one do you have next generation sheep within your sphere of influence and are you prepared to act on it do whatever you can in Jesus' name to help those lambs to be where they belong. Question number two, are you discerning the signs of the times that the next generation will face? Like if Jesus hasn't already come back, what's it going to look like 10 or 20 years from now in our society? Somebody says, I don't even want to think about that. Folks, try to imagine what it's like growing up in the 2020s. So much skepticism toward God. So much moral fuzziness. And the media is so contrary to our Christian values. There's so much darkness and, and deception and depression and violence and new age weird philosophies and gender bending and international chaos. All sorts of craziness going on in our world. However, the, the good news is that there's a lot of wonderfulness that's, that's mixed in as well. God, God is still good and, and there's still so much blessing of the Lord to be enjoyed and even Holy Spirit revival. So there's a lot of good stuff going on amidst all of the, the nonsense that's going on. But, but just think how confusing it can be for children and youth who are exposed to all, all of, of this that's happening in our current situation on planet Earth. These kids are are very young and impressionable. The, the key word is exposed. Everybody say exposed. See, it all depends on, on what you're exposed to or what you allow yourself to be exposed to or what you allow your kids to, to be exposed to. That's why it's so critical that these precious young lambs be exposed, constantly exposed to the Word of God, exposed to the presence of God, exposed to the power of God. Somebody say amen. Our kids need to be exposed to the love of God, exposed to the Son of God and all of the truth that he represents. I say, Holy Spirit, teach us about discerning the signs of the times. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, it talks about by constant exposure to the word of God, we develop a keen sense of discerning between good and evil, being able to distinguish between what is of the spirit of the Lord and what is of the spirit of the world so that we can embrace the one and guard, carefully guard against the other. You know, one day at a college football game, there was a, uh, a young man who was sitting next to an older man that was many years his senior. The two had never met before, but this young guy was kind of brash and boastful, and, and the two struck up conversation. And at one point, the older man said, well, he yeah, actually, back in the day, I used to play football myself. And the young guy said, oh, yeah, probably back in the days when the helmets were made of leather. Ha, ha. And then this young guy went on. He said, listen, my generation, well, I've grown up with jet planes and sending robots to Mars and nuclear energy and electric cars and high-speed internet. And when he paused to take a breath, that's when the older man spoke up and he said, okay, 
Okay, young man, yes, it's true. When, when I was growing up, we didn't have all of those things, so we invented them. Now I, I want to know what are you and your peers going to give to the next generation that follows on your heels? That's the question. Folks, it's one thing to be technologically advanced, but what we want for the next generation of sheep is that they would be spiritually advanced. That they would be prophetically knowledgeable. Lord, raise up a generation that will know their God and stand firm in the faith. No wavering, no confusion. Somebody say, amen. There was a young couple just gave birth to their first baby. And uh, so the the staff, they took the baby and, and cleaned up the baby and then bundled up the baby and they came and they handed the baby to this new rookie dad. And and this young father said, uh, how long do we get to keep the baby? And the nurse turned and she said, oh, about 20 years, give or take a couple. (laughs) You know, that's not what this young man was asking about, right? But the fact is, we have about a 20-year window of opportunity to have these young ones under our wings. And during that time, we need to pour as much Jesus and as much Bible into their system as we possibly can. All right, the last two points are are quick, but oh, so important. The third soul-searching question is this. Do you stress over a lamb that has already gone astray? Now, that's a question that might be hitting a nerve for some. Mom, Dad, if you have raised your kids to serve the Lord, but... But you know, one, one or more of your kids are not currently serving the Lord. Do not get down on yourself. Do not kick yourself around the block. No, sir. There's no condemnation. The only condemnation is from the devil, and we don't receive that. If, if your son, your daughter, your lamb has wandered away, pray for them. Pray for them, encourage them every chance you get. Love them in whatever way you can and pray for them. Oh, and did I mention, keep on praying for that young man, that young lady. Pray. Never underestimate the power of prayer. I want you to pray based on uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25. If, if, there's, if there's an individual in your family circle that has, has gone prodigal, Pray. Pray and hang your prayer of faith on this gl- glorious verse here in 1 Peter 2, 25. Now, this is the verse that has the solution. But first, I want to point you to the verse that explains the problem. So we've got a verse back in the Old Testament that explains what's wrong, and that corresponds to a verse in the New Testament that explains what to do about it. Problem, solution. Back in the Old Testament in Isaiah 53, verse 6, the prophet wrote this, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. Yeah, we turned on the Lord because of of that fallen sin nature that we all inherited from Adam and Eve. This is the biblical definition of sin, separation from God, distancing ourselves from God. That's a problem. But there's a solution in this New Testament age. The solution is found in 1 Peter 2, 25. That's where it says, For you were like sheep going astray. But now, now that you know Jesus as your Savior, now you have returned, return. Everybody say return. You have made a comeback. You have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is the good news. Returning to the Lord. Mom, dad, wrap your faith around this word of God and declare it over your son, over your daughter. I thank you, Lord, that they are coming to their senses, that they are returning to you, Lord. And if your kid has never known salvation, you be interceding uh, uh, just as well, praying, thank you, Lord for drawing my kid to your love. Thank you for bringing them to the kingdom. Thank you for changing their heart and causing them to be so wide open to hear the terms of the gospel. Pray, pray. There is power in prayer. Yes, there is. Pray 
according to 1 Peter 2, 25. Take a hold of that word of God and make it your own. Okay, final question number four is this. If the rapture occurred today, you know, the return of Jesus, you know he's coming back. Sooner or later, he's coming back, just as he promised. I tell you, if, if the rapture occurred today and Jesus came to, to just uh, retrieve his bride and, and just get us out of here. Take us back to heaven for a honeymoon. If that happened today, would your little flock all be in the fold and accounted for at rapture time? That's the question. That's a huge question. Because we're all about leave no lamb behind. Jesus explained this parable in verse 14. He said in the same way. In other words, the meaning of this parable is your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. And as you and I walk with God, as we get the heart of God beating in us, we pick up that exact same sentiment. Just like the Father, you and I are not willing that any of these young ones should perish. We're just not having it. We're insisting in Jesus' name. Lord, the kids within our sphere of influence, they're bound for heaven. They're coming with me, Lord. I'm not leaving them behind. No, sir. Come on now. Let's take the word of God to heart. Let's open ourselves up and receive what the Lord wants to say to us today. May there be a whole new level of, of passion born in us this afternoon. Come on, church. Would you stand with me? Come on. Just train your attention on the face of Jesus right now. These are holy moments of prayerfulness. This is a time for us to just, just, just focus on the Lord. Just make your commitment to Him. Yeah, just yield yourself to the Holy Spirit right now and say, Lord, I want this. I want to be a part of, of this evangelism program. I want, I want to be a part of this rescue effort. I want to do whatever I can to influence these precious young lambs. I'm not satisfied, Lord, to go to heaven without them. Lord, I pray that by the working of the Holy Spirit right now, as we stand before you in this sanctuary, Lord Jesus, may there be just a beautiful, powerful impartation of the Holy Spirit creating in every one of us, especially the moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would just infuse into our spirit, soul, and body just a brand new level of passion to reach out and to pray and to love and to do all that we can to influence influence the young ones to walk with you in a crazy messed up world. May we all be all about what you are all about, Father. We hear you. We hear you, Lord. We hear you speaking to us today and saying that you're simply not willing that any should perish. And we're here in your house today to say neither are we. Neither are we. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to, to give your grace its perfect work in us so that we can reach out and express to people in our lives how much you love us and how much we love you and, and how much those people can also love you. We're not dealing in starfish, Lord, but we consider that every person that we can help they're so precious in your sight. May they be precious in our sight as well. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Just let it sink in. Just stand before the Lord. Just wait on the Holy Spirit right now. Just let this word of God just filter into your system. Oh, dear Lord. Oh, the love of Christ, the love of Christ, the love of Jesus Christ. Fill us, fill us, empower us. Give us such wisdom, Lord, to know what to say and what not to say when we encounter some sheep that have no shepherd, when we encounter sheep that have lost their way. Lord, if anybody just dares 
to mention that they have Christianity in their background or that they used to go to church. Lord Jesus, may it cause such an incredible sense of alarm to just rise up in us and that we would just know that that's our cue to say something prompted by your Holy Spirit in that moment to speak the beautiful name of Jesus into that person's life. We are counting on miracles, Lord. We are believing for extraordinary, life-changing miracles. So help us, Lord. We are committed. As we go from your house today, we are committed, Lord, to reach out and do what we can to influence lambs that are within our sphere of influence. You help us, Lord. We are your servants. Come on, church. Before we officially dismiss our service, I want to have the privilege of leading us in that simple prayer of salvation because it could very well be that there's individuals here today and, and you're saying, Pastor, I, I'm that lamb. I'm that lamb that needs to be found. I'm that one that's gotten off track. I'm the one that sadly has distanced myself from the Lord, but I just know I need to get back to Him. Yeah, you're in the right place, my friend. So listen, before we all pray this prayer of salvation together, with every head bowed, every eye closed in this personal moment of dedication, I, I'm simply asking for a show of hands if you know that, that you need the Lord, if you're not so sure that you're truly born again, if, if, if you've gotten away from the Lord and you, you know that you need to recommit to Him today. Man, just put your hand up and wave at me wherever you are. And then we're all going to pray. Yes, I see your hand right there. Thank you. Are there others? Who else? Just wave at me. Please don't be held back by any sort of self-consciousness. Yes, I see your hand at the back. Good for you. It's the proudest moment of our life when we say, yes, please, Jesus. I need you in my life. Anybody else? Come on, just wave at me if you know. That's me. Yes, I see your hand at the back. Thank you. Someone else? someone else as we just wait on the Holy Spirit. Anybody else? Just boldly, courageously raise your hand. It's not so much for me, but you're just really saying, Jesus, that's me. Count me in. I so want to be a part of what you are doing. Yes, I see your hand on my left. Come on. Church, let's pray. Would you join me? Let's pray this. Dear Heavenly Father, of course I receive your gift of salvation. Jesus, I know you're the Son of God, and you died on that cross, and you rose from the grave to give me a brand new start in life. I receive it. I'm ready to run with it. Forgive me, Lord, for all I've ever done wrong. Cleanse me with your blood. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Help me to live out the Christian life. I will not stray away from you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. Give the Lord an ovation of praise. Thank you for joining our online service today. We pray that this service was such an encouragement to you from the beginning to the very end. If you're in the Regina area, but you've not been to one of our services, we'd love to have you come and join us. There's a seat here waiting for you. But if you're not in the Regina area, we look forward to seeing you right back here next Sunday.